I think we're uh, ready to start here. Uh, if we could have the lights out and the first slide on. Well, actually, I just mentioned to Billy Tsen that... <laughs> At any rate, I just mentioned to Billy that um, I really couldn't stay for the entire lecture since I heard Todd Williams uh, give basically the same lecture two weeks ago at UCLA. Um, at which point in time, uh, Richard Weinstein, the dean of the school, uh, read a uh, rather lengthy introduction which included some quotation from um, Keats. So I thought, well, this not being UCLA, I thought, well, maybe a more appropriate uh, recitation would be from somebody like Lowell George of Little Feet who said uh, onomatopoetry, poetry, symmetry and motion they heard about that girl clear across the ocean <laughs> um, which might be a more fitting uh, introduction to Billy Tsen so then I had second thoughts realizing this was an institution of higher learning and so I wrote four words down on a piece of paper uh, which were aspirations, moments, influence, and progression. Um, and then being somewhat of a shy person wanting to stay up here in the dark, uh, I decided I need my uh, uh, prosthetic devices, which in this case are slides. Um, so I decided to choose a few, which in the beginning have to do with aspirations. And in this case, I think it's Robert Mangurian's highlight of his life when he met <coughs> Elvis Presley. <laughs> and it was also certainly one of my uh, best uh, aspirations come true when I met Elvis Presley as well. Then some other aspirations which always don't pan out necessarily are when we decide to take up certain careers and then realize that we're not exactly suited for those, which <laughs> in my case was uh, to become a famous uh, Cajun musician um, traveling under the name of Davy Villa Savoie, uh, <laughs> which proved to be a little too difficult for me. So then, uh, thanks to uh, Paul Kaufman, I had my chance to play the rub board at uh, Al's bar. Uh, and I quickly realized that this was not for me either because you couldn't drink a beer and play rub board at the same time. <laughs> so then a little more serious thing kind of crept in, at least to my life, and uh, you might see how this has to do with Billy in a few minutes here. Uh, and that had to do with, in 1975, taking a trip with Robert Mangurian from Los Angeles to uh, what was then my parents' home in Ohio, um, uh, which we did this in a then 15-year-old Lancia Flaminia, which actually several people in this room disassembled this car several years ago. Uh, you can see what this looked like in 1975. You can also see what Robert looked like in 1975. <laughs> Uh, this being in Memphis, Tennessee, when we were getting the manifold uh, welded back onto the launcher. <laughs> so, again, these are moments, not aspirations. Um, then a, another moment occurred, and that was basically in 1974, and that's when I decided, for some unknown reason, to attend UCLA uh, School of Architecture. And at the same time, for totally different reasons, Billy decided to attend UCLA School of Architecture, uh, having uh, gone to Brown University and growing up in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Uh, she made the trek out to California. Um, and this is where the influence part uh, creeps in, because it was Billy who actually introduced me to this building, which um, was an oddity that existed on Oceanfront Walk, um, which um, had the mathematical equivalent of pi uh, constantly painted onto this building. <laughs> and then these are some other moments that uh, some things have changed more than others since, <laughs> since uh, 
1977. Um, and it's only because if you're taking the lead from somebody else, you're a little slow to cash on to either uh, intellectual trends or fashion trends. Uh, but again, we're still dealing with influences here. So in April or August of 1978, I decided to make a trip because Billy had then moved to New York and was working with Todd Williams. Uh, and I thought I was going to Long Island to see an architectural idea that had been highly discussed during our educations. And in this case, it was a Long Island duck. Uh, but instead, because the final destination was some renovations that uh, Billy and Todd had worked on, on on Long Island, I did see the duck, but then I also saw a building or a piece of architecture which I had somehow been avoiding um, for several years. Uh, then the next trip to New York was in July of 1981 when Billy was living on Morton Street uh, and this was the delivery of, of several cabinets uh, in which uh, Billy and Todd could basically store their lives <coughs> in um, my defined order, um, although I don't think they necessarily needed it. Um, then there were some other uh, uh, things that continue to occur and a lot of this was still in the uh, influence category but now we're also involved in the notion of progression um, which I think it's important to uh, continuously deal with these people who we find as influential um, and the more you can do it on a personal level uh, for me the better. Um, these are in March of 1982 when Billy came out to visit California and a group of fellow classmates um, who still are very much uh, part of a group that um, has to do with this notion of progression and influence. Uh, and while out here was uh, enticed to attend several fashion conscious parties. and also to see Catherine Lim, who is another one of our classmates. Uh, then there was another trip back to New York in March of, uh, sorry, in August of 1982 uh, for two reasons. One was to uh, submit an entry along with Billy to the window room furniture competition, uh, in which she was involved in with, uh, it was directed by Rick Scafidio and Todd Williams. Uh, but it was also to go visit their apartment on in the top of Carnegie Hall and also to make sure that the cabinets were still there as well and also to look at some of the furniture that they had recently designed for the uh, Asia Society building. Again this is August 1982 uh, and then you also go to their place to see what other kind of wild stuff they're collecting or dragging through their lives, which then influences your own. And the other interesting thing that was going on in 1982, which again was part of this trip, were several other items either of sculptural interest or architectural interest in that the Vietnam Memorial was under construction in Washington, D.C. The AT&T building was uh, nearing completion as viewed from the City Corps building. Uh, of prominence which although I don't know how much they knew at the time whether it would be as influential as it, as it was, Wu Hall was under construction on the campus of Princeton University. And Mr. Venturi was uh, no longer interested in ducks. He was collecting large uh, limestone balls that he was dragging to Princeton's campus. <laughs> This also included uh, going back to one of these moments that was important in my architectural education and it was visiting, revisiting uh, Venturi's house that he did for his mother, only to discover that portions of this symbolic molding were disappearing. So. <laughs> also at the hint of Billy, I went to see Marcel Duchamp's a large glass at the museum in Philadelphia. 
but by and large the most important part of the journey was to visit a floor in the city court building which Billy and Todd had designed. So once again it was uh, the bit of architecture that I found the most intriguing. Again August 1982. Then subsequent visits. Uh, this is uh, some fall views from their apartment in Carnegie Hall. This is fall and November of 1984. A view of Central Park. And out one of the side windows of their apartment near their kitchen. Uh, then this was a visit in May of 1986 and this might be a notion of progression. I think Billy and Todd have other opinions on it, but, but they're still here so I still feel comfortable because I know where they live and I can keep kind of mental tabs on them. Then another interesting thing happened in that they had a small son, Kai Williams. This was taken in front of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge Anchorage building and we had gone that day to see an installation that Elizabeth Diller and Rick Scafidio had worked on so you know there's still a little connection here. This is October of 1987. Oh sorry this is May. Oh I don't have the date on this Billy I forgot. <laughs> then this is Kai uh, being introduced to uh, high art architecture. <laughs> at such a young age. <laughs> Although, as you can see, he's not willing to conform to uh, uh, aesthetics uh, in a strict sense of the word. Uh, this is uh, October of 1987. So then, the last contact I've had with him was when they uh, visited Los Angeles last year. And I was happy to realize that uh, Kai, despite the uh, influence of Corbu, is still willing to recycle. Uh, and this was taken October 23rd, 1988. Um, so I guess in a, in a kind of convoluted way, um, I'm introducing Billy Tsen, um, who is as much an influence as the way I look at things is probably just about anyone else who's around these days. So Billy Tsen. Hard, this is definitely a hard act to follow. Thank you, David. Uh, the title of my lecture, somebody asked me to give my lecture a title. So uh, I said that I would try and make a, a title. Um, the title of my lecture is A Rock in the Water. But I thought that I would begin at a slightly smaller scale. A stone. Um, to be more specific, a touchstone. A touchstone was a black stone used to test the purity of gold or silver by the streak left on it when rubbed with the metal. It was also a test or a criterion for determining genuineness or value. Touchstone. When you listen to the word, it is actually very sensuous. Hold it in your palm. Feel the warmth of the sun. Hold the cold of the dark. The smoothness of the pebble at the ocean. Put it in your mouth. It is solid yet changed by time. Silent yet not mute. Obvious yet holding hidden histories. I have a cache of images and histories that I've constructed for myself that I use as touchstones to work. When my work can refer to or invoke these images, then I believe that it is genuine. As you might suspect, these image words are highly personal. 
which is taboo to discuss vis-a-vis -vis architecture, and are intertwined with my identity as a Chinese woman and mother, which is doubly taboo to discuss, although David seems to have brought up the subject. Nevertheless, I will discuss these subjects for a moment or two in the hopes of providing illumination and breaking taboos, hanging the laundry out for the neighbors to see, too personal, too revealing, too confessional, too embarrassing. I was born in Ithaca, New York, 40 years ago. My parents had left Shanghai just after the war to study at Cornell. My father first, and then my mother, four weeks sick on the fourth tier of a bunk bed on a converted battleship. Although I grew up as an American, the suburbs, dating, cheerleading, I've always felt an outsider. In a younger and more innocent time, I received compliments on how well I had learned to speak English. A reminder, along with my father's somewhat bitter words, you may think you are white, but people can see that your skin is yellow. A trip to China in 1979 was a shocking and then liberating experience, when followed by stares and whispers of Nakwining, Nakwining, foreigner, foreigner. I realized that I was a Nakwining there too. I simply do not belong. I recognized then that it was a tremendous freedom given inadvertently by my parents' immigration. There is no web to either save you or ensnare you. No fables are handed down, and you are left to make up your own stories, invent your own myths, by which to negotiate and fuel a creative life. It was a freedom, a giant silver balloon's tongue, tug, to take to the air, which is counterbalanced by a grounding that comes with life as a woman and even more clearly with life as a mother. Like many other women my age, I waited, in fact, never even really thought about children enough to realize I was waiting to have a child. In so many ways, I had been taught that life that art and children do not commingle. Whatever role models do exist were women who always chose one over the other. Virginia Woolf, Eileen Gray, Georgia O'Keeffe. The myth has it that the two roles must be considered opposed and mutually destructive. Sylvia Plath was the warning sign. If I have a child and try to practice my art, I will be left at home to put my head inside the oven. And even now, it's difficult to discuss for fear of being branded sentimental. Yet, in becoming a mother, I was confronted undeniably and inescapably with sources of life, death, beauty, growth, and corruption. Here's a quote from Kathy Colwitz. The artist, I am gradually approaching the period of my life when work comes first. When both boys were away for Easter, I hardly did anything but work. Worked, slept, ate, and went for short walks. But above all, I worked. And yet, I wonder whether the blessing isn't missing from such work. No longer diverted by other emotions, I work the way a cow grazes. Perhaps in reality, I accomplish more. The hands work and work, and the head imagines it's producing God knows what. And yet, formerly when my working time was so wretchedly limited, I was more productive because I was more sensual. I lived as a human being must live, passionately interested in everything. Perhaps I'm straying somewhat from my subject, but I think not, because I'm talking about something that I believe is vital to my art. Those are the critical aspects of my life that form my vision. And it is my vision that I hope will give me the power to make a transformation. Recognition on some level of the critical aspects of one's life is one part of forging of a personal vision. And these recognitions then become the touchstones to which I return time and again 
to test the authenticity of those ideas and forms that come in the work that I do alone and together with Todd Williams. So you see this one again. Um, this, uh, as David mentioned, was uh, a drawing that was done for a show called Window Room Furniture in which people were asked, uh, people in many different um, lives, to uh, in some way represent their idea of window, room, and furniture. And what I thought about at that time was um, a kind of memory of feelings that I had as a child about uh, these three words and a kind a sense of security. So this is really about that uh, room that you see before you sleep, a sort of cone of light that comes up from a lamp you sort of stare at before you fall asleep. This is the window that is the entrance to the two-dimensional world. And um, it was really talking about being a child and looking out a window and um, watching the night fall and seeing suddenly that uh, the window became a mirror and there is a reflection back. And this one is uh, furniture, the chair where your mother sat. And uh, it's really sort of memory about being held Um, one of the things, uh, until I went back, uh, went, went to China in 1979, I say went back, but having never been there, I went there. Um, I grew up never knowing my grandmother. And um, so when a competition came along, uh, <coughs> the subject of which was to do something about Columbus Circle. Columbus Circle is a uh, an, uh, really a kind of a strange situation in New York where streets that are off a grid come to streets that are on a grid. So Broadway, Central Park West, and uh, Central Park South all come together at Columbus Circle. And right now it's occupied by, of course, the statue of Columbus, but it's really become one uh, kind of giant traffic circle. I thought that the thing to do then might be to propose a way in which you could really memorialize Columbus, because after all, he was looking for the shortest route to China. And uh, also draw the sort of uh, fantasy that a child always has, and particularly I had as well. Um, so this is dig a hole to China. A few years ago, um, Todd had uh, a grant to go to the American Academy in Rome. And during that time, um, one always goes around with sketchbooks and pencils and in some way tries to capture the feelings and the texture of, of Rome. And I found it very, very frustrating because I never could really feel the sort of sense of the city around me. So. One of the things that I did was to start to make these plaster casts that incorporated um, pieces that I found on the sidewalk. In this case, uh, the skin of a blood orange. And uh, also to try and, and find some of the colors and hold some of the colors that, that were in that city and um, make tactile. Um, that sense of the time that I spent there while I was visiting him. And these then became a kind of uh, sketch for a series of rugs that um, were done. This is a, a yet another um, kind of, uh, of a collage of pieces that were put together while I was there. They came together as a, a, a series of rugs that uh, were done for a company called Vysotsky. And this is the first rug. It's called the silk scarf. 
And it's really about the sort of capturing and layering of um, different, I guess, different textures, and somehow making them very um, tactile, holding them together. So the top layer, which is actually higher than the dark green layer, um, is this rose-colored silk. And the silk has a hand to it so that when you walk across it like velvet, it leaves a trail. And then on top of the silk are, are dropped these kind of markings, which were seen as almost lead pieces, which were holding down the silk. And below it is a very, very flat, um, dark green field. This is a, another rug. It was done for some clients that had a sandstone floor. And so trying once again to sort of think about layers of, that were placed one on top of another. The lowest uh, layer is a, is a terracotta, which was the color of the sandstone floor. And then the next layer is the, the sort of slate blue. And then rising up higher, once again, is a kind of wool scarf and then binding it together are incised lines which um, act almost as a, or represent a kind of wire or thread which ties them together. Um, another thing that uh, became a subject of, of exploration um, was glass and etching glass. And this is a, a fairly old um, piece. It's a table screen that is made to sit on a table and transmit light but separate people. There are three panels. And the hinges are made from pieces of aluminum that um, we originally made a maquette and held it together with pieces of tape that were torn and then liked that shape so much that we made the hinges in that same shape. And there's a kind of dialogue that's going on between a, a kind of incised and very uh, taut line and uh, a line that's much more calligraphic. And then this is continuing with a kind of exploration of the possibilities of glass. It's a small room that was really a lacquer and glass box. Um, the shapes are sandblasted from the inside and then uh, painted with copper powder. From the inside, there really are just shadows. And from the outside, uh, they are really like leaves frozen in ice. And then trying to put together the glass with something that's somewhat more structural is, and in a way it's, it, it's starting to talk about the way Todd and I work together. Um, this is a glass tabletop with a, um, marks that are almost scattered or thrown across the top of the table. And um, the base is something that is much more uh, about Todd, I suppose, and has a kind of a rigor to it. And there's a, a dialogue that's working between the kind of um, logic that he used in, in designing the table base. It has to do, I think, with the way aluminum works and that it doesn't weld easily, so it's put together in mechanically. And um, the, a kind of uh, another layer which has much more, I think, to do with the kind of chance, which is the glass that I worked on. This is a piece which was done with Mary Miss, and it was a collaborative piece um, that was commissioned by the Craft Museum in New York. And one of the things that we felt very strongly about because is that we wanted to address the issue of use. Um, as art and architecture cross over, I think that both the burden and the glory of architecture uh, is the issue of use. And so we 
decided to make three public pay telephone booths. And um, this is a traveling show, so wherever it travels, um, the local phone company has to come in and uh, install the three telephones. Um, it's made out of very simple plywood um, with clear pine ribbing, perforated metal uh, view panels, steel plate, diamond plate um, is, forms its base, and there are um, aluminum uh, edge pieces and uh, circular grommets which hold this whole thing together. The three panels are hinged uh, because it's a traveling show and when the circular grommets are removed the whole thing collapses. We also wanted to break the taboo of um, untouchable objects inside the museum. Um, on the inside the, the telephone booths are painted with aluminum paint and rubbed with beeswax and we had hoped that as they travel they might start to pick up telephone numbers and messages scrawled inside. On the opening night of the show, we had people calling the telephone numbers from outside the museum in order to try and get people to answer the telephone so that they would start to interact with the, um, the piece. And for a long time, um, the phones would just ring and ring and ring because nobody would dare pick them up. Um, Finally, though, uh, we even got the guard to start using the telephone so that uh, people could understand that this was something for use and was an approachable object. And then this is just a detail of those metal circular discs which um, hold the whole piece together. Another uh, collaboration happened uh, with Jackie Ferrara and we were asked to design the site for an urban art, I guess, park, although it's hardly a park. Um, a group called Creative Time sponsors the installation of um, pieces of art in public spaces. And for many years, they had a, a program called Art on the Beach where they sponsored collaborations. And it happened in the site of Battery Park. Um, as Battery Park site, the landfill was filled up and is now filled completely with buildings, the Port of Authority offered this new site, which is on the other side of the East River in Long Island City, across from uh, really 42nd Street, although you see the City Court building in the background there. It's a landfill. Um, they cordoned off an area with a, a wire mesh fence and um, we were in some way supposed to organize that as a site for future collaborations. And while we were out there, we saw that there were a number of these uh, large concrete blocks and there was very close by a concrete plant. And when we went to visit the concrete plant, we found that at the end of the day, people, the, um, the truck drivers would pour the remains of the, their uh, concrete trucks into these molds, wooden molds, and then they would drop in uh, these um, wire cables and when the molds had set they would sell these blocks which were three feet by three feet by six feet uh, for ten dollars a piece and so we thought that this could be our building material. Um, one of the problems was that we found each uh, block weighed about three thousand pounds so <laughs> the price of the blocks was a little bit offset by the labor that it took to move them. And they also had a very uh, a kind of um, somber and somewhat frightening aspect to them, which I think um, worked very well in the site. I was always a little afraid that I'd start to see some, I don't know, hands or feet somehow sticking out of them. <laughs> in the last place, Jimmy Hoffa. So on the site, we simply uh, made a road that ran through the center, and then in a very... Uh, uh, severe and um, actually just very straightforward way use these blocks to define um, spaces where people then would do their installations. Also at the end of the street um, working with Jackie we made a kind of blockade because this was to announce the entrance to the site which as you can see is in a fairly deserted and industrial area. We took the blocks and put them on a diagonal 
that both had an order which is um, very much a part of Jackie's work and a sense of disorder because they are so crude and because of the sort of calligraphy of the, of the cables that run across the top. We also made three uh, stacks, four high, of these blocks um, to announce um, the presence of something strange happening a little further down the street and made this table um, which was pinioned to the, to the uh, road um, out of steel and out of stainless steel made a cash box which was welded to the top of the table. The holes except white umbrellas which were there to shield people during um, thunder showers or when it was really hot and sunny. And then uh, the following year we, um, having even less of a budget than before, took uh, fluorescent tape, the kind that's used to, on construction sites, and wove it through the chain link fencing and uh, took uh, glass embedded um, reflective tape and wrapped it around uh, poles that were metal poles that had been put up by the Port Authority to sort of mark off an area where part of the landfill was collapsing. And this was the last year um, that they used this site. Um, there, this is a performance and you can see in the background some of the pieces. And now this um, site is being developed as, once again, luxury housing. Uh, this project is um, also working with big blocks of stone, although this time they come from a quarry in Brantford, Connecticut, and um, it's a different budget. This is a person who owns a private island off the coast of Connecticut, and you see the shoreline, uh, the mainland of Connecticut, and so you, the island is really quite close, less than about half a mile from the shoreline. And this is a, his um, dock on the island. Um, it's made out of slate and the Branford granite. And in addition to the existing house which was built in the 30s. Um, in the back there's a stairway which leads upstairs to the top which is um, a kind of spa. It has a a uh, large hut tub in it with a wonderful view to the sound and this wall then hides the stairway that goes directly upstairs. We also reconfigured, um, we did a lot of work as beyond putting that um, dock in, we reconfigured the edge of the island um, and remade the seawall so that there was a, a kind of dialogue between the, the stones that had been there and uh, the, st the stones that were made. The ma there were wonderful people that we worked with, uh, the masons, who um, put together these walls out of these large uh, pieces of granite and then um, used the small pieces that, um, that are called chinks to infill between um, the large pieces of granite to make these walls. And this is a, a saltwater pool um, that stepped at the far edge and as the tide rises and falls, um, at high tide it comes up to the outside edge of the pool. We also worked as well on the docking facilities on the mainland and this is a bridge uh, that goes out to uh, the dock which of course rises and falls so that the walkway to the bridge is on this wheel so that it can move up and down with the tide. Once again, the intermediate part is from that is of that Branford granite and the light fixture. Uh, there, this is a, a competition um, for what they call the LA Art Park, although it's kind of a misnomer because it's located in, in the valley. Um, <laughs> so I guess somehow the Valley Art Park didn't have the same ring. Um, and our, uh, there are five buildings that were um, part of this competition and the building that we worked on uh, is the art gallery, the LA Arts Park Center. So it was a gallery and administration 
uh, building for this project. Um, the other buildings, um, the other people who won the competition, which may take a long time to build because they have to raise $160 million, um, were Morphosis who, uh, and Co-op Himmelblau, who worked on the uh, Performance Center, uh, Craig Hodgetts and Ming Fung, who uh, worked on the Natural History Museum, Adele Santos with Craig Hodgetts and Ming Fung, who did the Performance Grove, and Mark Mack, who uh, did uh, um, a media center. So this is the site plan. Um, you, the, our building is the first building one encounters as you enter the art park, and the entrance is um, really from the left, the lower left, along that treed area. And uh, you pass through the building, you drive through the building between two pieces of the building in order to get to the parking lot, which um, is the sort of treed area. The building is really very, very simple. It's two long bars, um, and it's organized as a kind of walking circuit, so that one enters the square building, crosses a bridge to the lower bar, moves through that lower bar, crosses an outdoor space to the upper bar, and enters one final space, which we call the conoidal space, and leaves the building. Um, we worked on this project with Ellen Zimmerman, the sculptor, and Cheryl Barton, who's um, a landscape architect. And one of the things that Ellen was very interested in is the stream which runs through the site. Um, it needed to be essentially left untouched, so she proposed that we make uh, a series of tiered steps in the stream, um, which would change and essentially what she called braid the flow of water. And here you can see, uh, in a closer shot, the steps which are um, in the stream, which cause the water to move in different directions and um, make different sounds as it moves along that braiding, and a bridge which allows uh, people to cross over to a kind of staging site for installation pieces. Um, so here are the two long galleries. And at each end is a, a, a space for an artist in residence. In between the two bars, we made a, a garden. And um, there's a recessed area which holds water. And then the rest of the garden is really a tilted plain, which um, leads one's eye up to the trees and the sky beyond, where you can cross over on the bridge. And this um, section is the last space that you enter before you leave the, art, uh, the building. And it's a, it's a space that would hold no art in a way. I, it is our, our art. It's uh, a courtyard which is open to the sky. It's shaped like a cone. And in order to enter, one has to duck slightly because the, um, the wall starts at about five feet from the ground. This is a, a project um, which is also about making a place for art. It's the downtown branch of, of the Whitney Museum, which um, has many satellite branches throughout the city. Um, this one happened to be in um, the financial district downtown in a Philip Johnson building. And the developer who gets all kinds of perks for giving away this space um, very generously gave away the sub-basement. And in order to, um, in some way, let people know that this uh, museum space was there buried actually beneath the level of the subway, we made this very tall sign so that people who were passing by on the sidewalk um, would have some idea that there was a branch of the Whitney uh, down there. We decided that rather than bringing people down yet another level, we would have them enter at a kind of um, mid-level. So uh, this is a, a kind of balcony 
which um, allows people to survey the show and in turn to be surveyed uh, at openings, which often is very much what openings are about. Uh, as well, the art can come in. Um, the front of that balcony uh, is a removable piece so that the art is then brought in and then um, rather carefully lowered down. Uh, the museum really wanted a space which was essentially a white box. Um, at the same time, we didn't really want to design a space that was a white box, so we felt that by ac making a sort of accumulation of details, we could articulate the box um, and, in a way, uh, announce our presence, yet at the same time make it a quiet eno enough space so that the art could live its own life. So um, the place, the, the space is really very, very simple with a, a kind of um, pieces of simple jewelry, which are all the sort of aluminum pieces. There are a series of light beams which um, make another more flat plane for the ceiling because the ceiling um, held a lot of plumbing and other kinds of things where <coughs> which prevented us from making it flat. And at the end of the stairs is a, a desk and some chairs that we designed. Um, that's a kind of information desk. The, the small roof that sits over the desk is really just there to, in some way, shield um, the kind of clutter that might appear in the desk from people who are first walking in at the top of the stairs. And then whatever services, electricity and the television um, cable are brought up through the three conduit uh, pieces that are rising from the panel that runs through uh, the terrazzo floor. Then this is, a, a once again, working and trying to make a place for art. Uh, a pool house that was done for uh, people who are collectors and um, it's a very, very private space because actually the pool house is entered from the um, master bathroom. And uh, it's very nice. The owners say the, at, at night when they can't sleep, they often will um, walk out into the pool house and uh, sit and listen to the sound of the water. During the design of the pool, um, there was a show at the John Weber Gallery of Solowitz wall paintings. And so um, we were very excited when she said that she was buying um, one of the wall paintings. And I thought it was very interesting because when you buy a Solowit painting, I never realized how it exactly worked, um, you buy the rights to it and then his crew will come in and paint it on whatever size wall you may have. So um, he painted, his crew painted it on this wall which is 18 by 60, but if you lived in an apartment that had um, a 10 by 12 room, his crew would also come in and paint it smaller on an 8 by 10 wall. And um, should you choose to move out, uh, you can take it with you because his crew will come in and paint it white and um, when you find the place that you want to be, he'll come back and paint it there. So I, I just thought it was a really wonderful combination of a sort of uh, something that was visual and something that was conceptual at the same time. And so um, this is the, the pool house with the, the painting um, glowing on the wall. Um, we thought a lot about how we were going to light this uh, wall um, and it receives many different kinds of light during the course of the day. There's a skylight that runs the length of the of the wall and so during um, the times when the sun is high the light comes in that way and then um, there are other times when the light comes in and hits the water. Um, this is a pool, a jacuzzi, which is at higher level. Um, and when it hits the water, it then um, sends light back, um, and it's a kind of moving light um, that reflects off of the wall. And in the evening, which is the time when um, they go in there when they can't sleep, 
it, the light will only come from inside the pool because um, there are lights that are installed and the underneath the level of the water and so then the pool glows and then that sends a very soft light um, onto, onto the wall. And uh, we thought that he would want to in some way change his uh, painting or have us work with him to move the window, the low window, which is the only window in that wall, um, in order to um, have some relationship with the painting, but he felt very strongly that it was really just an overlay, and he just wanted to overlay what was there. This is a shot at night. Um, another, this is a collaboration with Dan Graham. It's uh, not this, actually, <laughs> but uh, talking about a collaboration with Dan Graham for the Public Art Fund, they've asked us to make a prototype for a newsstand for New York City. And one of the things we talked about with Dan um, has to do with a kind of public responsibility. And so we felt that we wanted to combine um, a bus stop with a newsstand so that the private entrepreneur would um, extend a public amenity and at the same time um, in a symbiotic relationship, be able to sell newspapers to people who are waiting for the, for the bus. This is a typical newsstand in, in New York. And uh, this is the proposal for the newsstand. Half of it's a newsstand and half of it, half of it is the bus shelter. And it would be um, wrapped in a, a uh, mirrored glass, which is a, has a lot to do with Dan's work, so that during the daytime when there's a light on inside the newsstand, you could see in and see all the sort of wares and clutter and things that, that he has to sell. And in the nighttime when the um, lights are turned off and the metal door is pulled down, it becomes a mirror and um, it becomes very silent and only reflecting uh, the traffic and the people going by. The, the roof of this is a, a, um, a frosted glass and it's lit from above all the time so that it's always uh, a kind of safe place to wait for a bus because it's well lit. And then on the side we proposed there be locating maps that um, allowed you to figure out where you were on the island of Manhattan and as well a kind of drop-down seat for people who were waiting. A prototype is being made this year and will be um, installed in some corner in New York City. Then this was a proposal uh, that came after the newsstand and it was again for another bus stop, this time um, at Battery City. And one of the things that we had thought about was um, really the sort of island of Manhattan. And so this uh, roof uh, is really the two island, is the island of Manhattan and its mirror. And the supports are uh, run through Central Park, or sort of trees that pinion Central Park um, and support the island. As well, we thought about it uh, because there are it's really an area of, of very, very tall buildings um, about the way it would look from up above and hope that people would be able to both recognize it as the map of Manhattan and perhaps also think about it as some strange um, large butterfly that was flying down below. And that area which uh, was in the center um, being either alternately the Hudson River or the East River, we uh, were going to make out of blue glass. <coughs> this is a, another proposal um, that is for vacant lots in, in New York City. The city owns a lot of lots uh, upon which buildings that have burned or been torn down for various reasons. Um, and has allowed the, the lots to remain vacant and they're kind of like uh, missing teeth in, within the blocks. 
but at the same time they're sort of wonderful because you get to see into the center of blocks which usually you don't get to do and sometimes when there are two across you get to cross through the center of the block and so we were making a proposal about vacant lots and saying that they should be kept still um, empty but they shouldn't be vacant and uh, therefore the buildings that we suggested were really these tall cylinders on legs um, that allowed one to walk through on the bottom but then provided living units up above and in a way their kind of criticism of the building the large uh, housing projects of the 50s which you can see in the upper right hand um, area this uh, is on 136th Street and we you can see we took over a lot of other vacant lots and started planting our buildings um, wherever we could so the buildings would be these tall um, cylinders two tall cylinders which would be joined together by a, a central shaft which would contain the stairs elevators and uh, the janitor's closet and on each, uh, within each cylinder, um, there would be a core of bathroom and kitchen facilities. Um, and then the space could be developed almost in a loft situation to become either one, two, or three apartments. Um, and there would be, thus there would be no more than six apartments on a floor. And we thought that there would be a greater sense of ownership and therefore uh, a greater sense of care Uh, these were supposed to be slip formed concrete which would use the same technology um, that's used for uh, grain silos and concrete silos. And there you can see uh, in this case there was a this is an actual block um, which um, had a, a kind of a, a difference in in height from one side to another so uh, and there was an alleyway that went in between so we bridged over and allowed people to go up the stairs from one side of the block to the other side of the block and the floor plan showing the possible different configurations Um, and this is the last project. It's a, it was a proposal for uh, the Toyota Corporation who came to us and said that they were building, that they had a building in Osaka, which um, was really quite a terrible building. And it had a five-story atrium. They didn't think it was terrible. We thought it was terrible. Um, and it was the world headquarters. And they, on the lower floors, were going to have a, a really a kind of amazing um, audio, visual, multiple screen um, display of how cars are made. And that would um, take up five floors and there were, it was kind of a Disneyland of cars and there were robots and all kinds of things that were going on. And what they asked for was something to fill that five-story atrium space. And we decided that we would try and make an object of silence because there was so much um, activity and really noise going on all around and in a way um, also make something that had a form that was um, either bone or wing like because we were trying to make something um, that was acting in I guess opposition to what you would find there and uh, it would be a kind of solid when you entered a sort of solid garden and rather than locate it on the floor, we found that structurally it made more sense uh, to hang it from one of the um, upper beams. So it's hung from the fifth floor and uh, extends all the way down to just about uh, five and a half feet from the floor, just so you could, a Toyota could sort of clear it. Uh, in plan, it was. Um, very simple one entered at that curved form on the right and there was a, a perforated metal floor so you could start to uh, sense the space below you you entered on the fourth floor and the rest below you was a void 
there would be a, a solid piece of uh, plexiglass or um, plastic which would run the length of um, the, that space and which would have various sort of images projected on it so you could look into it and see these lights and colors sort of moving. And then if you went to the end of that space where there's a, a kind of fence, you could look down and look directly down the length, um, four stories to the ground. And just a, a kind of representation of what that space might feel like. Um, we also uh, propose that it be made using a kind of fiberglass boat technology um, so that it would be able to be um, light fabricated outside, put together there, and would be translucent so that at night it would glow in that space. This is where we work, our office. David didn't show you that picture. I do not know which I prefer, the beauty of inflection or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. It's Wallace Stevens. I know that I prefer the innuendos. I think it may have to do with that which is Chinese in me. So often the unsaid is as important as the spoken. The withheld is as important as the given. The two powerful themes in my life are the dichotomies of emotional sense of being an outsider and the physical reality of deep connectedness. I don't believe that it's literally expressed in the work. I would hope that it is implied. I use these touchstones as a source, as fleeting images that come just after. My purpose is not to be didactic, but rather to explain and to encourage. You at SciArc are learning to be precise. You are learning to be brave. You are learning to be artists. A definition of an artist is that he or she takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. In order to see the extraordinary in the ordinary, I believe that you must invest it with your own vision. And I believe that a recognition of the grain, texture, and fingerprint of your being is vital to developing your own vision. Once again, Wallace Stevens. It was when the trees were leafless in November and their blackness became apparent that one first knew the eccentric to be the base of design. The eccentric is not the crank, the loon, the misshapen. It is the personal experience, the memory, and the moment at dusk. We look for an architecture of unforeseen origin with the hope of authentic meaning. Its aim is precision, bravery, and a celebration of the as yet unknown. Thank you. If you have any questions, Billy will answer them now. Try to answer them. Anyone? <laughs> okay.
the, the, the indeterminate geometry of, of nature is uh, at play here in this project because of the, this idea of going into the earth and of being part of a set of really indeterminate forces, ultimately indeterminate. I mean, I was always fascinated uh, with the fact that our chemists and our present high technological civilization haven't been able to chemically analyze a cubic foot of topsoil to really break it down to all its constituents. It's so complex. The level of complexity, um, not even adding on yet this idea of uncertainty that modern science has given us and left us with, the idea that we can't really determine anything completely anyway, leads us inevitably to a kind of indeterminacy that I've wanted to explore in this project. Um, the old geometry was based on the idea of that we could know the, the nature of reality in, in its particulars, in its physical uh, limits. But the new understanding, the, the understanding that you know, I have come to uh, uh, finally, not that I have abandoned the other geometry, is this geometry of indeterminacy. Gary. Well, I don't know, because if you, if you set out somehow to begin to explore, I mean, if you, if you, if you say to yourself, well, I'm going to look at new possibilities, then you begin to push yourself into those areas, inevitably. Um, and I feel I'm just entering in at the end of the centricity drawings, as Neil pointed out. I began to explore this kind of geometry. and. Um, with this project, I went a bit further with it. Actually, I was hoping to present tonight maybe the, the latest project, which I've, I've been working on, but I wasn't able to do that, which again pushes the idea of, of exploring what these might mean to us. I don't know. I don't know if this is, uh, I can't say, and what I say in my remarks is that an experiment is something you don't know the outcome of when you start. Otherwise, it's not an experiment, right? So these are kinds of experiments, they're thought experiments, and they take the form of drawings. And it, ultimately, it's really up to you, all of you, each, each of you, really, each of you more than all of you, to decide whether there's anything here of value. Um, I'll continue on my way, but the reason I've come here to show you this is to let you make your own judgment. But it is about experimentation, about looking into the, the corners that haven't been as thoroughly looked into. Okay. Yeah. A morbid? Mo morbid? Did you just yeah, by morbid, I assume you're referring to death. I don't think it's unconscious. I, it depends on what you call joy. You know, uh, to me, that that uh, you know, there's joy in this work for me, anyway. Um, it's deprived of the usual, shall we say, middle class accoutrements, for sure. Uh, <laughs> but you know, this there is something that you raise with the word morbid which I accept completely because it has to do with this idea of mortality, with death, which in our culture is something which is, and in our personal lives is something very difficult for us to confront in any term. So there is this confrontation with this idea of mortality, with the death of things. 
in my work, definitely. I hate to end on that note. Can't we have? Can we, can't we do another question of more? Okay. problem I've always <laughs> not really not really because um, ultimately I consider myself just you know an architect and my concern is architecture and to me architecture is woven into life wholly so in that sense there's a relation to the idea of a narrative drama that you might see on the stage or on the screen but um, no, I don't, I, I'm, I'm an architect. I'm, I, I don't really consider myself a storyteller. Um, even though there's, there's a narrative dimension to the work. Okay, well, right, thank you.